Okay, everyone, we're going to do a different type of video today. This is kind of panning out the camera. It's kind of showing you what's behind the curtain. This applies to those of you out there who coach, who teach, who instruct martial arts, or if you have interest in ever developing your school, developing a training hall or a training club, wherever you are, a gym. This stuff might benefit you in some way. I have had questions from different people from all over that asked these following things. Uh, I like your teaching style. It's enthusiastic and light. Can you give me tips on becoming a teacher one day? Another question, do you have any coaching tips for mid-rank students of other styles? I teach Kempo part-time. Another question, is it better to give rank out even if people's abilities are different? Another question I got, I have a fear of public speaking. How do you make things look easy? They're not. They're not easy. Just a lot of um, a lot of training and instruction. I wish I could live near you and learn Budo. How do I become a teacher of martial arts? I'm a coach at my local ta Taekwondo school. I want some tips on becoming better. I feel like some of my classes have lost control. These things are very common. Anyone out there who runs a martial arts school, a large one like ours here, as far as student base, we have had well over 100 students for the last 15 years consistently, and I have about 100 students that are long-distance students of mine, and I travel around to teach. Just like anything else, this handout that I'm showing you is about 15 years old, and these things still hold up. They still apply even nowadays. These are what my instructors drilled into me. These are tips on courses that I've taken on instruction and how to be a better teacher. That's our goal. We don't want to get worse. We want to become a better teacher. Just like you start out at a white belt in any martial art, you work your way up to black belt levels. In the advanced levels, it's the same thing with coaching. No one starts out as a good coach. We're terrible. I can't tell you how many thousands of mistakes that I made and are still making to this day. The number one thing I would say is... Even though you might be labeled as a sensei or a teacher, we are always a student first. I think that's the number one thing that isn't even written on here. It's just kind of assumed. If you want to be a good teacher one day, you have to become a student first and you can never stop learning. You can never tell your students, this is the only way to do it because you look arrogant. This is the way it must be. The form breaks the form over a while. Every day that I teach, when I think about it, how many hours I put in, four hours a day, five days a week, that's 20 hours a week, 20 times four is 80 hours a month, times 12, times 20, thousands, tens of thousands of hours, and I'm still learning, which is exciting because you don't want to, uh, you don't want to lose your enthusiasm and get bored, or you shouldn't be a teacher. If you don't like to serve other people and help other people get better because it helps you as well, don't become a teacher. You have to have a lot of patience and you have to love the students. You have to love what you teach in order for that passion to transmit to the next generation. And again, none of this is really written in a manual, although I'll give some tips on what has helped our staff here and other staffs around in different dojos. First things first, things that a future successful coach is responsible for in each and every class. You're not going to always get these, but if you can get half of it or 20% of it, that's great. First thing is make your student's day by using encouraging words, actions, and follow-up relationship building affirmations. It's important to know who your students are and get to know them as people before they're even martial art instructors or coaches or students. It's really important to use encouraging words. Unlike Cobra Kai, where you have crease or these bad dojo sensei out there, remember that those are not real situations. That is played by actor Martin Cove. So crease is not a real guy. Miyagi Dojo is not real. Real dojos are about empowering people and not tearing them down and not teaching from a point of anger or frustration like Chris might do because you will have zero students. So if you want to become a martial arts school owner and you treat your students like dirt, they're going to leave, parents are going to sue you, all kinds of bad things are going to happen. You have to be tough, but that does not mean you have to be cruel, mean, or condescending to your students. 
Be prepared before you ring that bell. When you start your class, you should have what you're going to do already written down in note form or in memory form. Create energy and create high excitement drills and exercises. If you're a teacher that just stands in the corner and barks out orders, you're going to lose your students over time. They're going to get bored and they're not going to see you as a leader. A leader does what the student does. A leader gets involved. A leader hops into class and is very, very involved with the student's success and failures. So make sure that you create your own energy. If you are an instructor, don't blame it on the students for having a bad class. It's my responsibility as a teacher to create the energy to make everyone excited, pumped up, and ready to succeed. If you come into uh, the class with zero energy, the students are just going to fall and it's going to be a horrible class. And we've all had those. I've had those myself. But I realized over time, right, sometimes you want to blame the students for not having good energy. No, it's the teacher's responsibility to create that energy. Use outlines and notes. Use props and diagrams. Anything to help people who like to learn by visual aid. So we have a lot of diagrams that we use. We have charts on the walls. We have whiteboards that we write out the notes, the drills, the exercises, the talks that we're going to do the techniques. A lot of people don't learn by someone yapping at them and no one likes to be lectured to. These clients are paying you as an instructor to teach them, but not to sit there and show how much you know, to show off your skills in front of class. They want small, quick things that they can take home and use. So I would highly recommend as a teacher, you have your notebook ready, you prepare for all of your classes, and then prepare to have that all wiped by an energy change or something that might happen. No two classes are ever possibly alike. They're completely different. So expect the unexpected as a teacher. Be firm in bringing the students toward what works. That's very important. Firm is not the same as cruel. We expect high expectations of our students because we want them as a generation to be better than we were. That's my goal as an instructor is to make you guys everyone out there that's younger than me at my age better than I am. It's not about me being the grand poobah and staying up here and holding the students back, which I have seen dozens of times in different dojos. Guess what? They've all failed. Your job as a teacher is to throw the rope down the mountain and pull people up. The entire staff, that's our responsibility. It's not to dangle the rope, let a student catch it, and then let the rope go because you're jealous and envious of them becoming better than you. We want everyone to become better than us. That's our job. So being firm in what works. Keep the fantasy out of it as much as possible. Yes, some parts of martial art are about fantasy. Not everybody out on the street is going to attack us, but you have to keep it real. Would that punch work? Would this movement work? Would this grapple work? Would this ground movement work? What are the situations around us? You have to always have context with what we're teaching and make sure in the 21st century that it works with how your culture, your state, your environment, and the people will attack in your area. Don't assume that a scroll from 14th century Japan is relevant to 21st century America. It's not half the time. So as a, a teacher, you have to be an interpreter of what your teacher's teaching said, and you might have to vary them. Only expect small incremental improvements during a class. Never expect perfection on the first day or you'll always feel disappointed. This is a huge thing I've seen with teachers is they're like, oh, that was a bad class. No one got it. Well, did they get the first part? Yeah, but they didn't get step eight, nine, and 10. Don't expect perfection in one class. It takes months. It takes years to get that muscle memory in. If you can teach one child to do one little movement each day, that's a lot of movements over a week or a month's time. Don't expect a perfect class. Don't yell at your students if they can't get the seven move kata in one movement. They have to rep it thousands of times, hundreds of times at a minimum in order to see success. Just like you and I, we didn't, we, it took us years to get one movement. So don't expect perfection or you'll always be disappointed after class and your students will feel that. They'll sense that energy and they're not going to come back. They're going to quit. Get to know your students' individual needs in class. That's very important. What are their weaknesses? What are their strengths? And give them individual attention. 
If you have 15 kids in your class or 15 adults, it's your job as a teacher to move around each one and give them their individual needs while not being fake. Be sincere. Give tips to each one. Don't just lecture to the group and expect everyone to understand what you're saying. They won't. Some people need touch. Some people need stimulation with voice. Some people need to be shown exactly what to do. Some people need diagrams. Some people need to work in the mirror. Some have to stand next to you. There's a dozen ways to teach something and to transmit information. It's really, really important to get to know your students and what their needs are. Not every student's gonna be an A-plus student. Some are gonna be weaker than others. Some are gonna be poutier and whinier. Some are gonna be strong-skinned and some are gonna be weak-skinned. These are things that we have to do as a teacher is to find out each person's needs and then give them individual instruction so that everyone feels like they got something out of that particular class. If the students aren't understanding what you're saying, use mirrors or split the technique in half. Again, it's usually the teacher's fault, not the students, if something isn't being portrayed correctly. I use those mirrors all the time because we can all stand in unison and do the kata together. And if I find out it's too difficult for the new people, I'll slow the kata down. I'll show one movement at a time. If in an entire hour you only get two out of ten movements, fine. That's great. To me, that's a success. And then the next day or the next week, you can continue the kata. Again, don't put too much information out there for the student because they're going to bleed out of their ears. Their jaw is going to hit the floor and they're going to go home exhausted and they really didn't learn anything. Don't push too much material. Let them do one movement at a time and you'll see that the students will have more fun and they'll really understand the concept and the principle better because we slowed it down. K-I-S-S, keep it simple, stupid. That holds up in all business. Follow up with additional improvements the next week. Show that you really care. This is very important. As a teacher, I care about every single one of my students. Therefore, I hold them accountable. If I say, little Johnny, I want you to fix this and I want you to show it to me next week, make notes in your notebook and hold Johnny accountable when he comes back. Did you do your homework, Johnny? Did you practice what I told you? Did you practice at home? Did you study? You'll be able to tell if Johnny did or didn't study and then hold them accountable so that they know you care. If you go to classes every week and you tell your students what to do and you never follow up, they know that you're fake, you're insincere, and they're not gonna trust you and they're not gonna follow you. It's very important to follow up. Now, no one's perfect at that. We mess up, I mess up all the time. I'm an old guy, I write notes constantly, but I still screw up and make mistakes. And I feel terrible when someone says, Mr. Norcross, did you remember this? And I'm like, oh, I forgot, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, but I don't make excuses. I don't say, well, I was busy. I just say, I'm sorry, um, I forgot. Be honest, be truthful. Let's work on it right now. You'll never get it perfect, but taking notes and following up with students the next day really will make them understand that you care about their progress. Keep instruction to a minimum. Avoid the quote unquote, hearing your own voice syndrome. Can you do a class while instructing and only giving two sentences? Go do this, go, have fun. Five minutes later, stop, show one point continue. Don't lecture hour after hour. I know so many people that just sit there and yap, 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 like I'm doing right now, but during a class. And there ends up being 10 minutes of physical activity for an hour because the teacher wanted to show off what he knows and show five variations. Look how cool I am syndrome. I see it all the time. Not here, but when I visit other schools or I'm teaching, it's more important to let the students have the reps that they need and to shut up and let them train. As a teacher, be quiet. Occasionally, I'll do a class with no talking whatsoever. I just show the kata, go. That's it. An hour goes by, they've gotten 500 reps in, and I barely said five sentences, yet it was one of the best classes of the week. Why? Because they didn't have to hear me yapping. There are times where you will have to explain a concept, a principle, but know that every sentence that rolls out of your mouth the more your students' minds are going to wander and shut down and get distracted. Minimum talk is very, very important for a coach or instructor. Punch upward to the higher denomination. This happens a lot. People will, if there's someone in class who's not very strong 
or is um, a bit wimpy in different ways. Sometimes teachers go, okay, do two reps. Oh, you don't have to go to the floor if you don't want. You don't have to front row little Johnny. And then you have five students over there that want to do more, that are more advanced. Punch upward, meaning pull up that student to the higher denomination. Don't have them do two reps. Have them do 20 to 30. Have them sweating. We often will teach to the lowest common denominator, and that is not long-term a good way to instruct. It really brings the entire school down. It brings the level of competence of the students down, and it makes instructors lazy. Punch upward. That means give more reps than you normally would so that the kids or the adults leave sweating and smiling with a great workout versus doing two punches and moving on, two kicks moving on, triple it, quadruple it, just like we did. My teachers kicked my butt constantly, and I was so exhausted by the end of class, and those were the best. The ones where I did very few reps and didn't really challenge myself, didn't get out of my comfort zone, I don't remember those classes. Always do it with them. By that, I mean, okay, if you say to everybody, down for 10 push-ups, you get down on the ground with them. You want to be a leader. A leader leads. A leader doesn't hold students back. If, and I don't recommend it, you teach in a negative way where you're always punishing them, the old Cobra Kai method. I think it's a horrible way to teach. It's not long-term strong. It's a lazy man's way to teach. And it is often the instructor who has mental issues that will try to be angry all the time. There's often some childhood thing that's lingering. You can be a happy instructor and still be very firm and strong and tough. But if you tell your students, everyone down for 10 push-ups, you get down and bang them out with them. Don't just lecture and say, do it in this militaristic style. That will not gain respect. It will gain the opposite over years. And your students will not respect you. They will not follow you if you don't lead. By leading, I mean get down and stretch with them, do the push-ups with them, do the techniques with them, do the ukemi with them, everything you can if you're physically capable, do it and, and lead by example versus just lecturing and telling people what to do. Have self-deprecating humor. Failure is human and it's going to happen in classes. If you screw up as a teacher, I do it all the time, I did it last night, admit it to your students, sorry I messed up guys, I made a mistake, uh, I should have shown this, I should have shown that. I made a mistake and taught that wrong. Please forgive me. Let's go back and redo it. I do that all the time. And my teachers did, the ones that I respected. The ones that were on a high horse and a high tower that never made a mistake or hid their mistakes. I've seen it in Japan. Someone trips and falls and they're like, I meant to do that. You're like, BS, you did not. You tripped on the floor and fell. Why can't you admit you're human? We are not superheroes. So admit to your students when you screw up and they will respect you more. Just like anything in life, keep it honest. Keep it simple and say, look, I effed up, I'm sorry. No excuse, I'm gonna fix it. Sorry about that, uh, I apologize. That's the honest way to do things. If you mess up, let your students see that you're human. Very important. Another tip on coaching and teaching is award the good over punishing the bad. Let me say that one more time. Award the good over punishing the bad. There are times in, in your teaching career will, where just the class doesn't feel right. Something's not working. You might be in a bad mood. The kids are in a bad mood. The adults are in a bad mood, whatever it is. And if you punish the students because you're losing your cool, you're losing your confidence, and you get angry, and you punish people, first of all, no one likes to be punished. And if you're a young person, that can be quite traumatizing to have someone that you respect scream at you. I don't recommend it. It works for some people temporarily, but to teach from anger is not smart. To teach from frustration is not intelligent. However, some people respond to that negativity. There are people, even in the Cobra Kai false world, where people went to Kreese's dojo because they enjoyed the how he yelled at them and made fun of them and was arrogant and sarcastic. Some people respond to that in that militaristic way. Long term, I've never heard of a successful school owner who has maintained a dojo by doing that. Maybe for the day it works, as if you follow up later with a talk of compassion why you did it, that works. But if you're always yelling and banging out orders, I expect your dojo to last less than a year and expect no one to come back because no one wants to go 
and take lessons with someone who reminds them of their crotchety uncle or their abusive grandfather. They want to go to a school that inspires them and lifts them up, and they want to go to a place that is going to enrich their life, not make it feel bad. Often, I catch a student doing something so good, it's above and beyond the others, that I will award them something. Not all, all the time, it's rare, but I might give out a stripe or a patch or something, because I saw how good they did. And at the end of the class, I'll have the student show what they did in front of everybody, or I'll make a huge point about it, and it's not, you have to be sincere and honest and make sure it's truthful. And then I give that student a patch or whatever. The student is lit up. They didn't expect it. It was a complete surprise. They go home. They show their parents, look what I got today. I got this discipline patch because I was really good in class today. Well, that's great. That means you're doing a good job. And guess what the other students do? They see you giving out that patch or that award and they want to step up their game. And they come in the next day and they try harder, they do better, everybody's boats are lifted, the, the technique gets sharper. It's an overall good way to teach. Don't give out too many patches. It's not one of those things where the whole team gets a trophy. That's a horrible way to do things. And it will bring up a generation of people who are weak and a generation of people who don't want to earn anything and who will quit when it first gets difficult. So that's kind of the award generation. You don't want that to give out too many awards because it's fake and not everyone can win in life. There has to be a winner. There has to be a loser. And you have to learn how to lose with dignity. And if you're always giving out patches and awards, it's fake. And people can see right through that. And you're just giving people a false sense of confidence. And then when they get out in the real world, that gets knocked right out of them. Everything's about balance. Teaching is about balance. You screw up, you have a bad class, write it down, don't repeat it. If you have a great class, make note of what worked. Film yourself. Get out the camera and film one of your classes. You will learn more in an hour than you can do in 10 hours. Avoid confusing analogies when you're teaching. Keep it martial related. Quick and simple, 10 words or less. Just tell them to bend their knees. Remember, people are paying you to teach, not to lecture. I've said that a hundred times. Sometimes people will teach and give this huge analogy about whatever, and they go on for five minutes, and you completely wasted the student's time when all you really had to say was keep your hands up or bend your knees or uh, have some sharper technique, whatever it might be. Keep it simple. Can you use your analogy in less than two sentences? Because if you go on and on about something, the student does not understand what you're trying to convey to them and what happens. They lose their attention and they drift away and they, they don't like that. They don't like it. So keep your analogy short and pithy to the point or don't use analogies at all and just instruct. Move your knee here. Put your hand here and tell your students why you're doing it. When I took another martial art 30 years ago, I was never told why you do certain things. Kata one, do this, do that, do this. You might say to the instructor, dear sir, why are we putting our hand here? Don't you ask me a question. Just put your hand where I told you to. That's a horrible way to teach. Why are we doing this block this way? Why are we moving our leg that way? Why am I pivoting my hips over here? What's the timing? What's the distancing behind it? What's the reason? What's the principle that you're showing me here? A good teacher will convey all of that in a fun and exciting way. Underlined here is awareness is the connection to good teaching. Engage with everyone in class. Let them do the kata on you. Then you attack them. Be their heroic big sister, big brother, and inspirational coach. What I mean by that is, how often do you as an instructor allow your students to throw you to the ground? Probably not often because that's our ego that comes into play. If you have a younger student base, say anywhere from 6 to 12, they love it when you hop into class and you attack them with the technique or they get to hit you with the sword once in a while. Hop in, be like a big brother, big sister. A lot of these people are not getting any connection at home. They're stuck in their devices looking at their phone or computer. Father and mother get home at work at night at night and barely say a sentence to them. They want to communicate with someone older who they love and respect. Be the older brother, the older sister, the heroic boy scout, whoever it is that inspires the younger people to have someone that they look forward to hearing from every day. 
most of what being a martial art instructor is, is not, it is the martial arts, of course. You are teaching them how to defend themselves and how to be aware and how to become strong. And you're teaching them about morals and ethics and important things in life. But they're also here for a relationship. They want to be your friend. They want to look up to you. Our job as a coach is to inspire the students to be better than we were yesterday and be the best thing that they can be, whatever age or skill level that they might have. Make them better than they were yesterday. That's our job. Now I have bullet points which I'll go through very quickly of things that you should avoid if possible. If you feel like you've lost control in a class that is very natural, it happens all the time, take notes and find out why. You will internalize the secrets over time. It takes years. Then, loss of control in a class is almost unthinkable if you have 5, 10, 15 years of experience. Like everything in life you guys know, it's all about experience. Teachers are not born. They are created. And all of my teachers, I was a sponge and I listened to everything they said. I, I didn't copy the bad ones and I stole from the good ones all the tips and the tricks to becoming an instructor. And then I tried them out. My teachers put pressure on me and made me work on classes by myself where I made a mess. I was horrible, afraid to speak in front of people, messed up the technique, did things wrong forgot to give out things at the end of class, made every mistake possible a hundred thousand times. But over time, the secret is to make less and less mistakes. You have some good classes where people compliment you after class or your teachers who you respect send you a note or say, hey, that was a really good class. I love how you did this. You don't forget that stuff. Here are some things to try to avoid. Talk to your teacher, depends on your style, but overall, over the years, all the courses I've taken have told me the following. Avoid being a ne negative instructor. If you yell at the students, that was horrible, you idiot. You understand that that's not normal human behavior. That is an issue in our head. If you yell at your students, it is a poor and lazy way to teach. And you are not going to have any type of following, any type of school, or pride in yourself if you are yelling at other people. That is not a smart way to teach, and it cannot sustain itself. Teachers who are robotic and fake. Great job on your kick, Johnny. Great job on your kick, Sally. Great job, little Mikey. You didn't pee your pants today. This is fake. We've seen it a 100,000 times. Don't be that fake instructor who is just drolling on these ridiculous compliments to everybody. Everybody's doing so wonderful today. Gold star. You can't fail. Don't do that. We know that. We know it's BS. Don't be a robot and a fake instructor. Don't have sarcasm. A lot of people teach with sarcasm because they think it's funny. It's usually not. It's rare that sarcasm works. If a student says, Sensei, did you say go over there? Well, I told you to go over there, didn't I? I just told you to do that. That's the type of sarcasm really turns off a student and, and repulses them away. Try not to be sarcastic. Funny and pithy is different than sarcasm. It's a whole different thing. Whole different thing. Don't stop the whole class if one person is doing something wrong. Again, a teacher will do that because he or she wants to hear their own voice. You praise them, correct them, and praise them individually. You don't stop the whole class ten times in a class because one guy's doing it wrong. Let them train, take the person off, do your job, and take them individually and work hard on that person. If the other 10 get it and one isn't, let the 10 continue to train and get muscle memory. Take the time, have the patience to take the one off to the side and show them. There's nothing wrong with that. They will appreciate it more. Don't stop the class to hear your own voice. I see that all, that's probably the number one thing, is the teacher, I gotta stop class. Uh, He's doing it wrong. Well, what about the others? Well, no, let them go. Let them go. Let them go. Small incremental improvements. If you teach from anger and you're yelling at your students, Bobby, go sit in the corner. Ah, uh, long term won't sustain. There are times you might have to do that. I've had to do that. I just expelled a student a few months ago because he wasn't doing enough. Uh, he wasn't doing his testing correctly. He was failing his tests. He was uh, disrupting classes, he was lazy, he was not doing what was required, and he was expelled. Can he come back? Of course. I want him to come back. I felt horrible expelling him, and I've, and I've expelled a couple 
over the last 20 years. It's extremely rare, but I did everything over months or even years in some cases to get the student to connect. But over a while, if they don't connect, you have to remove them from the environment because they will tear down the rest of the student's morale and they will destroy the energy and spirit of the class. That must happen occasionally, but it's very rare. But if you're yelling every day at your students, you're not going to have any a week later. It just doesn't sustain itself. Don't lose your patience as a teacher. If you're always yelling, I've had enough of you, that sticks with people. That symbol I'm staring at right now in the window means patience. It means endurance and perseverance. Don't give up. That includes the teacher. If we have a bad day with our wife or wherever outside, you don't bring that energy into your class and you don't take your problems out on your students. They're there to be inspired by you, not to have to uh, be your psychologist for the next hour. So it's really important not to lose your patience in class. If you need to take a quick break and go get a drink and hop off the mat, go for it. Flush your face with cold water, take a breath outside. If you need to do that, have another coach take over. These things might happen. You might be feeling sick to your stomach or you just found out your dad has cancer or something. These things are gonna happen. We've had uh, students that we've lost, they've, they've died. These are horrible things that if you have a school for a long period of time, you will encounter horrible things that are going to happen. Accidents happen. People get hurt. All kinds of things happen. But you have to kind of keep it professional and keep the class going. And then maybe break down in the car on the way home at the appropriate time. But there is a time you have to stay strong, stay patient, and show your students we're going to get through this together. Don't be arrogant. Don't always say, look at me and what I did. Often as instructors, we want to show more than the students can understand. So we show all these cool variations, these henka, and we show how to do it with a sword and a stick and a chain and a gun. And we show five different omaplatas. The student doesn't care. They're not going to be inspired by the arrogance of the teacher. They're going to get bored. And eventually, you show everything in the first 10 minutes and you're like a clown and then you have nothing more to show. You don't keep your secrets, and therefore it won't sustain itself. So be very, very careful not to over-teach and give too much. That happens a lot. Be very careful. Don't be indifferent to your student because you don't like them. I've seen coaches where they actually dislike a student for whatever reason, and they will ignore that student in class and they'll almost never talk to them. They won't give them instruction. The poor student is the only one at the end of the day that didn't get any attention and they don't understand why. This does happen. It is human nature in some schools for the teachers not to like a student for whatever reason. Maybe they remind them of themselves as a kid. It doesn't really matter. Don't be indifferent to your students. Everyone matters. Everyone's there to learn. It's our job as teachers and coaches to give it our all and to be sincere and to acknowledge everyone in class. If you find yourself singling out a student that you just don't like for some reason, ask yourself, why don't I like this person? It's not them, it's actually me. I need to improve this quality in me. It's not about them, it's about me. It's a weakness in me. And then go home and work on that. And then when you come back the next day, you might have a different attitude toward that person. What is your body language like in class? Do you cross your arms all the time and just scream, bark orders? Do you chit chat to your fellow coaches and teachers because you don't care about your students? I see that a lot. How arrogant. Don't stand like this. It shows that you're closed off to the world. It shows that you think you're better than everybody, that you're not willing to listen, that you know it all. Uncross your arms. Be welcoming. A teacher should be sweating. A teacher gets in there with them. It's very, very important how your body language is. Lean forward when you're teaching. Have enthusiasm. Have excitement. We don't want to be like the guy in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Bueller. Bueller. That type of teacher is easily forgettable and someone that's the most uninspiring person we can imagine. We're going to go to the next dojo down the street. No one's going to care to learn from that person. Be exciting with your body language and bring the energy that you desire to class with you. You will have coaches that jockey for position. They'll fight with each other behind the scenes. They will backstab each other. Uh, it doesn't happen here, but I've seen it in other schools and I've experienced it myself. And sometimes you can have a fellow coach that's just a jerk. They have some childhood issue that they bring into their coaching 
and they feel with this position of power that they can now ex exude this power onto other people to feel better about themselves because maybe as a child they didn't have any power. And if you give some people a little bit of power, they go crazy and they just think they're a god or something and they will not last. I've had those and they were immediately, let, I just like, you can't coach. Either you fix this or you can't coach at my school because you are arrogant and no one likes you and you're being a jerk right now. So if you don't switch that, I'm going to ask you to leave. Almost always you can, you can fix that issue, but you will see that coaches and fellow instructors will try to backstab each other for positioning with the head sensei. This happens a lot. It's kind of the nature of the game. Again, because we have a small area here, none of that goes on. But I have been to big, big, big schools where coaches were fighting behind the scenes, doing everything in their power to step on each other, to try to get the favor of the head instructor, or to get a rank faster, to get more money, to get a raise, whatever it might be. Just more, they wanted more power. And with that power comes instant corruption. As a teacher, we want to be the change that we wish to see. The positive, inspiring, strong, forceful, yet compassionate teachers that I've had in my life, I am still friends with, I still respect, I still bow to and homage. The teachers that were jerks are doing whatever, they're in jail, they're whatever, wherever they are, they're not teaching martial arts, thank goodness. If you want to be a coach or an instructor, it's one of the most noble professions there is. You have to want to serve and be patient with other people. You have to uh, kind of let yourself out there with all your mistakes and all your foibles. But it's so rewarding to lay your head down on a pillow at night and know that you did a good job today by serving your community and your fellow students. And you learn. Every day is exciting. It's never, ever, ever boring. If you're bored as a teacher, please, do yourself a favor and your students and change professions and allow someone who is more enthusiastic and loves the craft to come in and take your position. There's no shame in that whatsoever. If you don't like your job, we all have the freedom to leave it. All of us. With hard work, we can leave it. Now, to finish up, you know you got it right. You know you did a good job with your class if... You ring the bell or you say class is over and everyone's like, oh, already? It's been an hour already? You know you did good if that happens. If you hear someone yelling out, this is fun, this is great, I love this. Good, doing your good job. If they come in the next day and ask if they can do that again. Remember that thing we did? Can we do that again today? You might say yes, you might say no, or you missed it, you weren't here Tuesday, we did it then. Whatever it is, if they're asking you to do stuff over and over again, you're doing something good. If they ask you, as you're, if you're a coach part-time and you only come in once a week to coach and they say, Mrs. So-and-so, will you be here next week? I'll be here with you. You're doing something good. You're developing a relationship. You're building something together. They're going to listen to you more. They're going to respect you more. This is what it's all about, that connection, that awareness. If they draw you a picture, if they make you a birthday card, if they bring you in candy at Halloween, whatever it might be, something is going right. This person cares about you and they want you to be their sensei and their teacher. So the coach, whatever you're doing is working. It's working. Keep doing that. If they ask you to do something, if the student says, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Smith, can you watch me do this front roll? Can you see? Maybe their parents aren't involved in their life. Maybe their father's not around or their mother's not around. You might be the only male role model they have or the only female role model. And they might say to you, They've had no interaction with an older person. And a nine-year-old kid says, can you watch my technique, sir? Can you imagine saying, no, I'm too busy. I'm going to go drink a coffee. Of course, you say, yeah, show it to me, little Johnny. And he shows it to you like, great job, Johnny. You're good at that. Let's do it again tomorrow. This is what it's about. This is what it's about. You're watching them grow and you're helping them. You're becoming a surrogate brother, a surrogate teacher, coach, father figure, whatever it is, a surrogate Yoda. These things can happen if you're fortunate enough and privileged enough and you save up the money and you do the hard work and you don't quit. You can get your own training club, your own training hall, your own school, your own gym, your BJJ studio, whatever it is, and you can give and serve. If they just say thank you, they just say thanks for this was a good class. Thank you so much. Or 
they get their black belt and you're standing there all proud and drenched in tears because you saw this person grow from this eight-year-old little skinny wimpy kid to a 13-year-old strong, confident person who's now become a junior coach with your help. They're getting their black belt and they say, thank you. You're like a father to me. You're like a mother, whatever it is. I couldn't have done this without you. You know you've done it right. You can go to your grave prideful and knowing that you had a good and meaningful and purposeful life. This is what any type of teaching is about. It's not just about martial arts. We can use these at home. We can use these at school. We can use these in the workplace. And wherever you have a relationship of any kind, try these out. Not all are foolproof. Not all of this is 100% accurate. These are tips that I learned over the last 25 years of teaching full-time, tens of thousands of hours, and I still have a dojo that's going stronger and stronger every year, even through COVID. We've had one of our best years yet. Why? Because we adapt, we evolve, and we follow the positive coaching. And it's not fake. It's real and it's genuine. And everyone that works for me or is a coach here part-time and volunteers their time abides by these lists and this is how you learn. This is how you get better. And I hope, I hope it really benefits at least one person watching. You can go back to this and view it again when you're feeling down or you have a bad day. And I'd love to hear in the comments section what in your school works. If you have a school and you have students and you have a tip and you leave it in the comments, someone might read that because I'm sure I missed a hundred things in here. This is just the tip of the uh, iceberg. So with that, my friends, how do you become a coach and teacher? You have to be a student first. You start at white belt. You work your way to black belt and the advanced degrees. And you do not quit. You do not give up when things get tough. And you keep going. You have to keep going and inspire by your years and years of training. That in itself is worth everything. Good luck in your training. I hope you become a coach or an instructor one day. I really do. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you for watching. Click subscribe and click that bell thingy if you want to get more of these free videos every week. We'll see you next time. Good luck.